Hey, Dr. Kabulo. Hello, Dr. Bennett. Hey, good morning, Dr. Gabulo. How are you? How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And you? You're in the Congo, right? No, I'm in Japan. Oh, Japan. Oh, that's right. That's right. With Dr. Kato, of course, of course. Yes, with uh, Dr. Kato. <laughs> how, how are things going? No, everything is going well. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're yes. going to you're gonna be there for a while? I'm going back next month. I just came for my fellowship in cerebrovascular. Oh, okay. Very yes. good. And, and uh, next month I'm going back to Congo. Okay, good. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So, so things are going well with the with the uh, webcast from from Africa. Uh, so yes. we Sunday, we'll see you Sunday. Okay. Uh, now there's there's a. Uh, Many webcasts, I don't think you'll be able to moderate all of them, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll try to get some help for you, okay? Okay, no problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, I, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Kazadi, I, you said he's going to travel and be traveling, and he cannot make it, correct? Yes, he's traveling Sunday, and he can't make it. So okay. he's going to Zimbabwe via Ethiopia. Yeah. Okay, give him so our best. The, the, the webinar, he will be flying. Okay, give him our best, and uh, I hope he likes the, the webcast. Yeah. And, yet, and I guess you guys are going to start one too, right? Uh, I, I told, uh, I told, uh, you know, man, the names are getting to me. Uh, <laughs> Well, so I, to, I told told someone that they wanted to have a separate one for the Congo too. Uh, yes, yeah, that's fine with me. That's fine. That's fine. With yeah, me. that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yes. fine with me. So if mm -hmm. you guys want to do it, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. let me get the gentleman's name. It's not right that I should do that. Do mm -hmm. this here. Hold on. Yeah, he's a. I, I always talk to him on Facebook. Oh man, okay. So you're seeing a lot of surgery though over there in Japan? Yes, a lot, a lot. We are operating almost every day. Mm -hmm. Oh, are, are you uh, actually touching the knife? Or... Yes, I'm, oh. I'm going getting into the field, yes. Yeah, Professor Sakato oh. has planned a very nice uh, fellowship program. So oh. when you're doing your fellowship, you have to be also in the field. You can assist the surgeon, you can suture, you can do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the, yeah, Dr. Lakuya, Hervé Lakuya, uh, he he mentioned that I think he that they may, may want another one, and I yeah, said, Hervé from my country. We wanted to start also a, a webcast in French from uh, Congo, organized fine. by that's Congolese fine. Society of Neurosurgery. So that's every fine. month, every month uh, one. Uh, so we are planning that. I'm the one who initiated that, and I charged him to contact you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just let me know. Just let me know, okay? We are still working on the topics. Tomorrow yeah, we have a meeting. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow me, Sunday. Me... Once we are done, we'll send you the program up to December. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me know from uh, you guys. Okay. I gotta. I gotta do some stuff. I'll. I'll be back. Thank you so much. I'll be okay. back too.
Good morning, everybody. Why am Vassin? How are you, how are things in Mongolia? Can you hear me, Bayan Batson? You're muted there. Hi, uh, hi, you can hear me, right? Bayan Batson? Yeah, you I'm here. Okay, yes. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm glad to see you can come. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Now I'm going okay, outside. We, we, outside. Okay. Yeah. We start. We start in ten minutes. Okay. Okay. If the connection is not too good. We don't, we don't hear it well. What can you hear, Doctor John Bennett? You can hear, okay? You can hear. Yes, I'm here. Good, good, good. good. It's a good, it's a good topic for Mongolia. Yes. I need. Uh, I need more precise about superior chance. Okay. Yes. Okay. I I never use I never never used superior chance. Okay. I, I wish. Well, maybe in the future we could get a better connection. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, the connection is not too good now. But if you can hear, that's good. Uh, put, okay. the screen, put the screen in front of the hospital. Eventually, it'll evolve to that with, with people in the auditorium to sit down and watch a lecture such as this. Which is valuable for three people. And why not broadcast for them to a student? Of course, We start in about 10 minutes. Quicker the sound now. We started in nine minutes, approximately. Yes, one of the things we have to do is immediately post it on a couple of heavy traffic sites like a neurosurgery cocktail. Uh, well, it has about 30,000 followers, uh, as well as LinkedIn is an important source of traffic. Uh, and of course, the mailing list. That's a blast of this webinar. So the, the reach is, I think, quite far. Many people watch a broadcast like this on YouTube. And 
they're really not measured by the bots, I don't believe. So I tell the presenters that uh, don't count on the panelists. There are a lot of people watching that for some reason or another, they, they don't want to interact. That's fine. They can just watch it anonymously. You know, something we have a panelist here from Mongolia and by ambassador, I hope you can understand. But a place like Mongolia, of course, they every neurosurgeon has to handle every problem, inclu including uh, pediatric problems. Uh, I'm not sure if they refer out or in. Uh, they probably take care of them there. And um, Batu Gator, I believe the town, main city is. Okay, we have the panelists coming in slowly, dripping in. The speakers. Welcome, everybody. Does anybody want to say hello? Well, you guys being mean to me. We go live on the air in five five minutes. So, Sudipka, you you're ready, right? You're going to moderate, Sudipka. A lot of these guys are so busy, as you know. I'll shut this off here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm muting you. Uh, I am we really can't hear you well. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm trying to admit the speakers, but they don't seem to want to come in because they're rejecting the invitation. Uh, so, Dipka, you have to come in the panel when they ask you if you want to be promoted. Yes. Yes, you want to come in. Decline. So, Dipka, please accept the invitation. You're declining it. Oh, are you that busy?
So Dipka appears to have disappeared. Okay, could the other panelists please check in, please? I need to talk to you. Tasfia, Mohammed. Hi, hi, Dr. Tasfia. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm doing fine. We're having Sudipka has, I think he's having problems getting in. Who was the first presenter? Because uh, we can I think start. I'm the first presenter. Okay, you're the first presenter. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Then if we have to, I'll. I guess I'll introduce you, or I'd rather have actually someone else, Doctor Armand. I think, who can yeah. present? Who can introduce you? Uh, I think Doctor Armand can. Okay, Doctor Armand, could you please uh, introduce the first speaker? Amar, you, you're muted, Dr. Aman. Please uh, unmute. Uh, hello, John. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Welcome back. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Sudipka looks like he's coming in here. Okay. He probably got to a better computer. I'll let him start the ball rolling when he comes in. Sudipka, can you hear me okay? Hello, Sudipka, you there? Hey, he's unmuted. Now we're just needs to get on the screen. Okay. Hi, Sudipka, how are you doing? Okay, fine. Good, okay. You ready so, to start? Can you hear me? Are you, okay, I'm going to introduce you first, right? Okay, sure. And then you introduce uh, uh, Tasfia, okay? Okay, sure. Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Good morning. This is uh -huh. uh, Bennett broadcasting from Miami. We have the honor of presenting. Hello, Dr. Sharma. I'll give it so much to you. Yeah, hold, hold on, hold on. Okay, I'll start it again. Hi, this is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting huh? from uh, Dr. Sharma. Hello? Okay, let me mute you, Dr. Sharma. We'll start it again. Okay. I don't know what that Dr. Sharma... Okay, we'll start again. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach. Uh, we are honored to be televising the, uh, the second broadcast of the Bangladesh uh, Neurosurgical Society uh, led by Sadipka Kumar Muherjee, a neurosurgeon from uh, Dhaka. And I'll let him introduce the first speaker. Good morning, Sudipka. Good morning. Uh, good uh, afternoon, John. Thank you very much for introducing me. This is a continuation of series of uh, program on pediatric neurosurgery grand round. I am Dr. Sudipta Kumar Mukherjee. Today, we have five eminent speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Tasfia M. Choudhury. She will discuss on ventricular subgalial shunt. Dr. Tasfia, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Tashfia Montas Chaudhary, resident phase B of neurosurgery at the National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital. Uh, today, I'll present a brief uh, on ventricular subgallial shun. Uh, we know that hydrocephalus is a common uh, neurological problem in the neonates, and ventriculoperitoneal uh, shun placement is the widely accepted choice of treatment uh, for CSF diversion. But sometimes uh, patients may not be suitable for these procedures. So there are various uh, temporary CSF diversion uh, procedures that can be done in units suffering from uh, hydrocephalus. So, uh, when so it was first described in 1896 by uh, Mikulich and then there are successive uh, publications. So uh, what is uh, ventricular peritoneal? So what are the temporary CSF diversion? procedures that are available. There are lumbar puncture, there is percutaneous intermittent ventricular tap, ventricular access device, and external ventricular drainage. Now, what is ventricular subgallial shunt? Uh, it is a procedure that entails creating an artificial shunt between the uh, ventricle and a pouch that is created in the subgallial space where the CSF can be absorbed. So if offers a natural way for CSF absorption through the cervical lymphatics draining into the subcavial region. Now, as the CSF drains, the pocket would enlarge and it will act as a CSF reservoir. And once the amount of CSF outflows the ability of that pocket uh, to absorb, the head circumference will eventually start to grow and it will become tense. So it usually takes an average of about three weeks to reach this point after surgery. Now, what are the indications of doing ventricular subgallial shunt? Among various uh, indications, uh, one of the main indications is this is for premature neonates for whom interventricular uh, hemorrhage is common for a malnourished child. For those uh, in whom ventricular peritoneal shunt cannot be done due to increased infection in the abdominal cavity, and we know that prematures usually suffer from necrotizing uh, enterocolitis. Again, if the size of the baby is small, that is less than 2 kg, uh, if the baby has systemic infections, and various papers also show that uh, VSD can be done in patients with post meningomyelocyte hydrocephalus, in post infectious hydrocephalus, and hydrocephalus also associated with posterior fossa brain tumors. Now, what is the procedure of doing ventricular subgallation? First step is assembly of the VSG shunt. As you can see that here, uh, two shunt tubes are being uh, connected. Each uh, is with a three to four centimeter length uh, using a connector, as you can see here. Then uh, this is the distal end or the subgerial end, and it is closed uh, by tying its uh, exit. And two one centimeter long cuts are made along its length to act as a slit valve. This will, uh, this will allow one-way direction for the CSF flow into the space, but not out of it. Second is the creation of the subgallial pocket. We can see that a curvilinear incision is made over the frontal region, anterior to the corneal suture, about three centimeter lateral to the midline, which is basically the copper point. And then a large pocket is uh, created with blunt dissection under the galea. And on the opposite side of the scalp uh, with a blunt dissector, a 270 degree is run exactly in the same plane from the coronal suture to the lamboid suture and across the posterior fontanelle to extend to the other side. And the temporal is fascia and the forehead are avoided. Uh, as far as possible, the pocket should be created posteriorly to create a generous subgallial pocket. And we should avoid treating the pocket in frontal area for uh, cosmetic reasons. So, this is the subgallial end of the VSG shunt that is being placed into the pocket. And before tying the VSG shunt to the periosteum, we should recheck the connector so that it's not too close to the hole in the skull to prevent kinking of the shunt. And eventually, the closure of the skin is done in one layer. Now, the fourth part is the post-operative care. So we should apply a loose dressing uh, to the wound because any maneuver that prevents the expansion of subgallial pocket is discouraged. Uh, for example, uh, pressure dressing over the incision or the pocket or avoiding, the, avoiding placing the baby on the side of the surgery. And uh, it's to be noted that these uh, small details can uh, result in failure of the VSG shunt, so we should be careful. 
Uh, one of the common pitfalls uh, in this procedure, uh, we should make sure that the distal end is tied off and split is uh, splits are made. This failure will allow two-way CSF flow into and out of the subgallial pocket. So lack of fluid into the pocket will hinder its expansion and result in premature failure of the shaft. Another thing is that the subgallial pocket should be of ample size to accommodate the CSF. A large pocket can prolong the time to failure of VHG shunt as much as possible. And before skin closure, we should check if the VHG shunt is straightened because the tube can be occluded if uh, we tie the suture too tightly or by placing the connector too close to the bar hole in the skull causing kinking of the VSB shaft. And we must avoid, as mentioned earlier, to put any pressure against the pocket either by positioning or tightening the wound dressing. And for the success of VSG, it should be noted that full expansion of the pocket is necessary. What are the advantages of ventricular subgenial shunt? So this is a sustained and relatively controlled way of CSF drainage into the pocket. It is much less labor intensive. It can be done as a bedside procedure. It is quick and easy to do. And uh, in this procedure, the chance of pouring carefully is significantly lower. It is not associated with fluid or electrolyte loss. And it is inexpensive because we can use previously, con uh, previously cut shunt tubes and uh, connectors. And others, uh, other advantages include that the risk of infection compared to other temporary procedures is not high, shortened uh, hospital stay. And the golden advantage is its longevity before placing uh, VP shunt. <clears throat> like any other procedure, it also has a few complications. One is CSF leakage at the site of the suture. Uh, premature failure that is within five days after surgery. Catheter might be dislodged, there can be migration of the catheter, uh, obstruction or acute ventricular uh, decompression. Infection, breakdown, exposure, and revision of the shunt might be needed as we can see in post-tubercular meningitis, probably due to high protein content of the CSF. So these are pictures showing uh, some of the complications following VSG insertion. As you can see, picture A shows CSF leakage. Picture B shows uh, shunt exposure here, and C shows scalp infection. Now prognosis. Uh, general subgallial uh, pocket creation can result in increased longevity of the shunt as mentioned earlier. Hydrocephalus resolution after VSGs is rare. And after a definitive CSF diversion, such as VP shunt placement, the VSG shunt pocket will slowly and gradually disappear. And if the VSG shunt fails, then another VSG can be placed on the other side of the cranium if certain conditions of the baby prohibits uh, doing definitive procedures. Um, morb morbidity and mortality are mostly prevalent in patients of younger age and lower uh, weight uh, due to increase uh, owing to the thickness of the skin as in decreased thickness of the skin and maturity of the lymphatic channels because with advancing age we know that the thickness of the skin increases and lymphatics are more uh, mature hence results in better success rate of the vsg and so the vsg usually the mortality rate varies between uh, 9 to 20 percent and while removing vsg shunt uh, one zero six suture is placed percutaneously to tie up the distal catheter, obviously under sedation. And if there is no clinical or radiological evidence of ventricular megaly after 72 hours, then it can easily be removed under general anesthesia. Uh, in our hospital, VSG was started in 2018. Total, as of now, a total of 13 VSG procedure has been done. Eight patients are alive and five patients, unfortunately, have passed away. So these are uh, some of the pictures of patients from our hospital. This is after the procedure. You can see here is the VSG pocket. And this is also a picture of a child before placement of VSG. And on the left, after placement of VSG, we can see that the nutritional status of the patient has been improved much. These are the references that have been used. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Taspia for presenting a newly uh, that, that is the old procedure but we uh, practice it uh, recently and this is a rescuing procedure but sometimes it causes devastating complication if not uh, properly followed 
and now i introduce our honorable director he is eminent neurologist of this country and uh, our director sir professor kaji din mohammad sir he uh, is the founder of our national institute of neurosciences and hospital he can say something for us sir please Uh, sir. Sir, apna 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 roi kane mona stop. Okay, I think uh, we're having trouble getting. Okay, is this is this for the far? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you see? Can you can you see me now? Yes. yes. Uh, we see and hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a special thanks to Mr. John for arranging this kind of a special uh, academic sessions uh, from Bangladesh. The topic today is hydrocephalus, which is actually, to be honest, very, very important because it is not only that the uh, medical part is related, but there are many, many emotionals, socials, and family parts are also there. You know that when a baby just born or just after a few weeks after born is having a big head, that becomes a sympathetic issue for not only the patient, parent, but also for all of the neighbors and their relatives. Why this baby is getting large head? And Dr. Sudipta and his team is working on this issue for a long, long time and solving in many ways, admitting the patients and getting operations and improving. But still then, this is a huge problem in my country. And from this program, I think our team from neuroscience will learn a lot to disseminate their ideas and getting the new ideas from the experts in this field who are connected, and this will be a very big achievement for the surgical department in neuroscience. I am very glad to be here today, and I will hope to be here every time in future, because being a neurologist, I have got also interest in some of the aspects of neurosurgical issues. One of these is hydrocephalus, because these are the problems which Actually, we need a team approach to teach. That means not only neurosurgeons, there should be social workers, there should be parents, and there should be other physiotherapy we have experts. So I again thank John for helping us in moving forward and putting our good step in quite ahead uh, so that we can gradually go top of the uh, learning process in this in this field. I thank Dr. Sudipta and his team for arranging such a wonderful academic session. Thank you very much and thanks a lot, Mr. John. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Your every word is a direction for us and we always follow your direction. Sir, next, our next presenter is Dr. Mohammad Nahid Hassan. He will present a very important topic that external ventricular drainage, a life-saving procedure. Dr. Nahid, please.
Yeah. Can you hear us, Dr. Hassan? Dr. Nahid, we, we see your screen sharing, but we cannot hear you. Please open, unmute. Yeah, Mohammed. Okay, yeah, let's get. Mohammed. Sir, can you hear? Yeah, now we can hear you. That's fine. Yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, yeah. Can you please instruct him how to put it on presentation mode? Uh, no, sir. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Right. Ah, we niche dikhe dekho last year ata presentation mode ase. To kulle bado hobe. Shobai dekhte shobi dekha hobe. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, perfect, Excellent. perfect, Excellent. perfect. Okay, onward. Still can hear. Mohammed, are you is your voice okay? Um, sir, uh, can I start, sir? Sure, Nahid, you can start. Okay, sir. Sir, um, external ventricular drainage, a uh, life saving procedure. I am Dr. Mohammed Nahid Hassan, resident uh, phase B neurosurgery in National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, external ventricular uh, drain is one of the most common and most important life saving procedures in the setting of acquired brain injury. EVD is a closed sterile system consists of intraventricular catheter typically placed directly into the anterior horn of lateral ventricle through a bar hole in the skull and attached to a external uh, drainage system. And uh, what are the indications of external ventricular drainage? First of all, uh, life threatening acute hydrocephalus then uh, any situation which causes raised intracranial pressure like intracranial hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, infections, neoplasms, ventriculoperitoneal shunt failure, and traumatic brain injury. And uh, contraindications like uh, coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, and uh, scalp infection. And now the anatomy of external ventricular drainage. The most common entry point for external ventricular drainage insertion is Cocker's point on the right side, located one centimeter anterior to the coronal suture and two to three centimeter lateral to midline. In most adults, this corresponds to a point along the mid pupillary line and 11 to 12 centimeter posterior to the nasion. Entry via the non-dominant right frontal lobe is preferred to minimize the risk of damage to the language function and eloquent cortical and subcortical motor regions. Lip-sided Cocker's point and occipital trajectories are less commonly practiced. The picture showing this is nasion and this is the midline. This is coronal suture. This is mid pupillary line. The uh, usual trajectory point is right Cocker's point, which is situated the one to two centimeter front, uh, uh, in front of coronal suture and two to three centimeter lateral to the midline. And from uh, the mid pupillary line, it is about 11 to 12 centimeter from the nasio level and this is the most common uh, places for uh, the EVD insertion. Now the procedure of external ventricular drainage. Procedure will be done under general anesthesia. Patient will be in supine and head rest position. Patient head will be in lateral, left or right, according to operation site. The portion of the head will be shaped 
surgeon makes a tiny incision in the scalp and drill one hole through the skull. The catheter will be inserted to drain the CSA fluid from inside the skull. Catheter is anchored and skin will be closed. Catheter is connected to drainage system. Here picture showing the, the entry point of uh, external ventricular drainage which is connected uh, to the uh, external uh, reservoir. And uh, there is some points. Uh, this is zero point and this point is fixed for the external um, ventricular drainage uh, system. And uh, this point is zero point who is correspond to the level of foramen of Monroe. And externally, it is correspond to the external um, uh, auditory canal. And the EVD management. Correct alignment is important for accurate control of CSF drainage. The zero reference point for an external ventricular drain is correspond to the point of intraventricular foramen or foramen of Monroe. The external anatomical reference point which correspond to the position of the intraventricular foramen is external auditory meters when the patient is supine or sitting up. But when the patient is lying down, this level is breeze of the nose. That means the zero point who is uh, correspond to the level of foramen of Monroe and externally, external auditory canal. When the patient is supine or sitting position and when the patient is in lying position on their side, then and the breeze of the nose is the level. And the height of the drip chamber equals to the intracranial pressure. This pressure must be reached before any CSF will drain into the collection system. And for a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage and an unsecured aneurysm, it is important to set the initial height of the external ventricular drain so that CSF is not drained too quickly to avoid a rapid change in transmural pressure across the aneurysm wall, which may lead to re-bleeding. Now, the complication of external ventricular drain is there are several complications in this area like bleeding during surgery, misplacement of a tip of the external ventricular drainage cranial end, and uh, it may uh, obstruct and infection is most common. There is a chance of seizures, lack of CSF, uh, leakage of CSF, and anesthetic complication, stroke, and accidental injury to the brain, which leads to movement disorder, weakness and memory related problem. Uh, the picture showing there is a infected CSF, most probably it is due to pseudomonas infection. Now the criteria for external ventricular drainage removal. Removal of EVD is uh, most commonly preferred by a gradual waning strategy and a clamp trial. This involves raising the height of the drain by five centimeter every day until a level of 20 to 25 centimeter is reached. The drain is then clamped and the patient is observed for the next 24 to 48 hours. Reopening of the EVD may be required if intracranial pressure exceeds 20 millimeter of mercury for over five to 10 minutes or patient is clinically deteriorated or symptoms of raised intracranial pressure is developed. CT scan are obtained before and after the clamp trial removal of, um, removal of external ventricular drainage is contraindicated if ventricle is enlarged or signs of hydrocephalus is developed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nahid, for your excellent presentation. We all of we know that external ventricular drainage is actually a life-saving procedure. We, if we do, do it timely, then convert uh, sometime we can remove, sometime we can convert it into uh, permanent CSF diversion. Uh, the question and succession will perform in the later. 
now our uh, speaker is dr dm arman he will present ventricular anatomy as well as endoscopic third ventriculostomy for hydrocephalus dr dm arman please can you hear me yes perfect i i will share my screen Perfect. Can you see my? Can Can you see my? Yes. Perfect. Screen? Yes. Perfect. I am starting now. Thank yes. you, Dr. S K Mukherjee. Welcome to session two of Pediatric Neurosurgery Organ Next Series. It is organized by Neurosurgical TB and Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery. my heartfelt thanks to john bennett and ak mukherjee i am dr d m arman work as assistant professor in the department of pediatric neurosurgery going to present my topic on endoscopic third ventriculostomy with different scopes and endoscopic ventricular anatomy not work okay so it's not it's not going forward this is not work prashant pa you'll get it take your time There you go. Okay, it's moving. Working, working now. Sorry for interruption. I am Dr. D. M. Arman. Work as assistant professor in the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery. Uh, going to present my topic on endoscopic third ventriculostomy with different scopes and endoscopic ventricular anatomy. Yeah. Good doctor. What type? What type? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is our hospital. Uh, it is a 500 bed hospital situated at dhaka capital of bangladesh uh, here we more than 40 neurosurgeons work here uh, in the last year we perform near about 3000 operations uh, in the operation theater facilities we have seven operating microscope metronic Uh, neuro navigation system and also have uh, intraoperative neuro monitoring puja machine crm and all types of endoscopic setup uh, interventricular flexible and rigid endoscope we have got recently <coughs> latest tip on tip flexible neuro endoscope and various type of electrical uh cranium and drill system uh, our director professor kaji din mohammad sir and joint director professor uh, badrul alam sir they are renowned neurologist of this country my heartfelt thanks to director and joint director sir for their dynamic and dedicated leadership to ensure good working environment and to provide optimum a uh, full set of instrument equipments with latest technologies <clears throat> in the department of pediatric neurosurgery from 2016 to till now we did 
uh, ETB is 292 and we performed more than 500 operations in the last year. Uh, the study of outcome of ETB is in progress. Introduction, neurosurgery is a rapidly evolving specialty that often plays a leading role in adopting new technologies. Although CSF terms are the most common surgical treatment for the hydrocephalus, a second surgical treatment option is endoscopic third ventriculostomy. ETB is one of the most widely performed procedure in neuroendoscopy. ETB is a technique to make an opening in the floor of the third ventricle, develop communication between third ventricle and prepotent system to bypass the obstruction to CSF flow using an endoscope. This is third ventricle, this is prepotent system. We make an opening in the floor of the third ventricle, communicate third ventricle to the basal system, that is prepotent system. History of evolution of neuroendoscopy. The first therapeutic application of endoscopy was in the field of urology in 1873 by Joseph Grunfeld from Austria. The roots of neuroendoscopy actually begin within the field of urology. Victor Darwin Laspines, a urologist in Chicago, utilized a rigid cystoscope in two infants with hydrocephalus in 1910. Walter Dendy, considered to be the father of neuroendoscopy, developed an open form of third ventriculostomy. He coagulated choroid plexus. The first ETP was performed by W. Jason Mixter in 1923. Victor Lespines, Walter Dendy, and William Mixter were the pioneers for introducing endoscopy in neurosurgery. Earliest instruments used for this purpose were cystoscope and urethroscope. The major improvements in the optical imaging was brought about by renowned British physicist, Professor Harold Hopkins. The rights to his work on the lens system for endoscope were purchased by Carl Storch company from Germany in 1960. Takanori Fukushima used flexible endoscope in 1970, first biopsy in 1973, Griffith used rigid scope in 1977. The multipurpose ventriculoscope described by Henry Schroeder in 2008, uh, he did interventricular lesion biopsy and resection in addition to ETB. Pediatric lotus system from Carl Storch was conceptualized by Henry Schroeder. I have a good memory with renowned neurosurgeon Professor Henry Schroeder, he visited uh, Bangladesh in 2019 to perform in live workshop in Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. It is or, it was organized by Bangladesh Society of Neurosurgeons. I must thank to present and past president and secretary and all exec executive committee members for their regular arrangement of such type of live workshop and international conference. In this picture, beside him, I assisted him by holding endoscope. After operation, he appreciated for good assistance. It was a great moment for me. ETB is indicated in obstructive hydrocephalus. That means obstruction proximal to arachnoid granulations causes enlargement of the lateral ventricle and third ventricle, referred to as triventricular hydrocephalus. Primary cause is congenital equidacal stenosis. Secondary cause may be neoplastic or vascular. Vascular causes uh, vein of Galen malformation and neoplastic causes mainly posterior tumor that causes obstruction to the equidactal equiduct that causes obstructive hydrocephalus and tactile plate glioma also causes 
obstructive hydrocephalus. ETB, uh, other indication in managing shunt infection. This is posterior fossa tumor obstructs the aqueduct and causes obstructive hydrocephalus. ETP also indicated in idiopathic fourth ventricular outlet obstruction. We did ETP seven years back in patients with headache, vomiting, and blurring of vision. After operation, his vision is much improved. In her uh, follow up visit, recently we did MRI. Ventricular size returns to normal and he's clinically all right. This case report, idiopathic photoventricular outlet obstruction successfully treated by endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, I published in Journal of Bangladesh Society of Neurosurgeons. ETP does not work in communicating hydrocephalus, fire defect in the arachnoid Granulations, ETP may not work if patient age is less than one year because their uh, subarachnoid space is less developed, may not work in mmc related hydrocephalus with small ventricle and in CNS infection. ETP not possible or does not work uh, if abnormal anatomy or distorted anatomy is present where basal system are not adequate in narrow space present or scarring or addition present or in previous ETB failure, ETB may not work. There are two types of endoscope available, rigid and flexible. We have a rigid endoscope and also flexible endoscope. There are few advantages of rigid endoscope. It has superior optics, more fiber optic, better image quality, several working channel. It has variable sizes, one size for adult and one size for periodic patients. This advantage of rigid endoscope is lack of maneuverability. So we can approach only lateral or third ventricle. Advantage of flexible endoscope is it permits maneuverability or flexibility. We can approach lateral third ventricle, also equiduct. Through equiduct, we can see fourth ventricle and its contents. And through stroma of the ETB, we can see also basal systems. This is advantage of flexible endoscope. This advantage of flexible endoscope is it has limited fiber optic, poor EMS quality, and one working channel. We have rigid endoscope. This is used for uh, adult patients. Its diameter is 6.1 millimeter, length 18 centimeter, working channel diameter 2.9 millimeter, irrigation suction channel 1.6 millimeter. It has fiber optic light transmission. It is uh, sterilized by autoclave. This is operating sheet or operator sheet. This is operator. Its outer diameter is 6.8 millimeter, length is 13 centimeter. This is little lota ventricloscope used in periodic patients. This is less diameter, outer diameter 3.6 millimeter, length is 18 centimeter, working channel diameter 1.6 millimeter, irrigation suction channel 0.1 millimeter. It has fiber optic light transmission. It is sterilized by autoclave. This is operating sheet or operator sheet. Its diameter is 4.5 millimeter. Length is 30.3 centimeter. This is operator. Advantage of little lota ventriculoscope is narrow diameter. We can approach in narrow foramen of Monroe in adult, also periodic patients. This is earlier version of flexible endoscope. Its outer diameter 3.7 millimeter, working channel 1.5 millimeter. It deflects 120 degree down and 170 degree up. 
this is narrow diameter catheter this is two working channel light source attached here and camera head attached here this is steering uh, steering causes movement of the this catheter in two direction this is flexible uh, monopolar uh, monopolar electrode called bugby its diameter 5 fr, FR working length is 53 cm it is used in flexible endoscope to fenestrate the floor of the third ventricle also hemostatic purpose we have got recently this is latest chip on tip flexible video neuroendoscope earlier version of flexible endoscope has limitation it has poor image quality this chip on tip flexible video and neuro endoscope has overcome it it has improved visualization high definition camera integrated led light source so no light cable needed its outer diameter is only 2.9 mm elliptical n tip working length 35 cm working channel 1.2 mm 1 mm flexible instruments are used in this uh, neuro endoscope it is sterilized by ethylene oxide it has advantages it enhances visualization and used in narrow foramen of monroe in adult also pediatric patients and in addition to etb we can do tumor biopsy through a uh, flexible neuro endoscope how we do endoscopic third ventricular stone etb is performed under general anesthesia patient is positioned supine with head placed on a head rest elevated to about 30 degrees surgical site is prepared curvilinear incision is made at cocker's point 1 cm anterior to the coronal suture and 3 cm away from the midline if we do equiductoplasty bar hole is placed more anteriorly 2 to 4 cm anterior to the normal usual site a bar hole is made location of the bar hole may be adjusted by navigation in order to optimize the trajectory for making the third ventriculostomy dura mater is opened by linear incision margin is aparted pyometer is coagulated brain cannula is inserted into the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle and dilated the cannulation with brain cannula after entering into the frontal horn the lateral ventricle we found this is cord plexus this is thalamostatic vein this is septal vein this is from monro and this is fornix during endoscope manipulation fornicial injury may occur that causes memory impairment in the form of retrograde amnesia after entering to the third ventricle mammillary bodies basilar artery translucent tuber cinerium and dorsum sella and infundibular recess are identified if this structure cannot be visualized then procedure should be aborted the site of fenestration is chosen more anteriorly to avoid vascular injury to the underlying basilar artery floor of the third ventricle is fenestrated with bipolar or unipolar electrode this is bipolar electrode only gentle push make the fenestration no need coagulation if needed care must be taken from diathermy injury to vital structures this is the fogarty balloon catheter a two or three of fogarty balloon catheter is used to dilate the opening balloon is inflated distal to the opening in the floor and is then withdrawn through the opening opening is 4.5 mm is usually enough when we inflate the balloon usually it slips uh, sometimes down and sometimes up 
inflated balloon when it feeds the margin of the opening it effectively dilated after fenestration sometimes second membrane is found this is called liliquescent membrane this is also opened if present after fenestration we can see this is basilar artery and perforators after completion of the etb pulsatile flow of csf is observed through the opening into the floor of the third ventricle this is mammillary body this is basilar this is tuber cilium that forms the floor of the third ventricle this is infundibular recess the ventricles are inspected for any areas of hemorrhage and are obviously irrigated before removal of the endoscope dura is closed in watertight fashion we usually do dural closure is reinforced with peritoneal strip now i will show few cases uh, where i did etb first case is 15 years old male presented with headache vomiting blurring of vision mri of brain showed triventricular hydrocephalus and this is tactile plate glioma which obstructs the aqueduct and causes obstructive hydrocephalus we did etb with rigid endoscope that is periodic size little lota ventriculoscope after entering into the lateral ventricle this is cord plexus this is perforated septum pellucidum this is thalamic stud vein this is septal vein this is foramen of monro fornix entry column of the fornix we enter into the third ventricle this is mammillary bodies tuber cilium translucent this is floor of the third ventricle this is basilar top and this is dorsum sala this is infundibular recess first we see ventricular anatomy then we can choose site for fenestration we use bipolar electrode for fenestration just gentle push no need uh, energy just gen gentle push make a opening opening is already created now opening is dilated with fogarty balloon catheter this is balloon catheter 2 or 3f balloon is inflated to dilate the opening often it slips down or slips up it dilated effectively if inflated balloon feeds at the margin of the opening
after completion of ETB, we can see basilar artery through stroma. You can see pulsatal CSF flow is observed through stroma of the ETB. Next case, three years, two months uh, old male presented with headache and vomiting. CT scan showed obstructive hydrocephalus and uh, Dendiwaka variant is seen. We did ETB with visit endoscope, periodic size. After entering into the lateral ventricle, we can see this is thalamus, which forms the lateral wall of the third ventricle. This is thalamostrate vein. Deficient septum pellucidum. Cord plexus of the opposite ventricle is seen. This is for Amanda Monroe, fornix. Cord plexus goes down to the temporal horn. This is corded nucleus component of the basal ganglia, which forms the lateral wall of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This is anterior column of the fornix. After entering third ventricle, we see two mammillary bodies and basilar artery with posterior cerebral artery and its central branches. This is oclomotor nerve. This is oclomotor nerve. This is translucent tuber cinerium, which forms the flow of the third ventricle. This is dorsum cella. And this is infundibular recess. This is chiasm. This is chiasm. We usually choose for fenestration in between dorsum cella and basilar artery. With rigid endoscope, it is hard to move behind. This is interthalamic adhesion. This is cerebral equiduct. During manipulation of rigid endoscope, care must be taken to avoid pharnicial injury. This is thalamus. This is thalamus, which forms the lateral wall of the third ventricle. This is bipolar electrode, try to make an opening in the floor of the third ventricle. I try to dilate the opening with this bipolar electrode. There is a second membrane. There is a second membrane. This is called Liliquous membrane. It is also part opened. And there are other perforated membrane also present. We try to open all membrane.
uh, this is ablution now. This is ablution now. You can see. And this is basilar artery with perforators. This is abduction nerve, six nerve. You can see pulsatile flow already established. We try to make more opening in multiple membrane below the floor of the third ventricle in prepontent system. You can see positive flow of, of CSF is observed. Again, we see this is interthalamic adhesion. And this is thalamus. This is cerebral acuitat. It is difficult to go far behind with rigid endoscope. Care must be taken to avoid fornicial injury during endoscope movement. Anterior column of the fornix, this is white matter band, connects hippocampus to mammillary body. Fully deficient septum pellucidum. This is dorsum cella, floor third ventricle, basilar artery. This is chiasm, interthalamic adhesion with aqueduct, cerebral aqueduct, posterior commission. This is oclomotor nerve below the posterior cerebral artery. This is thalamus. This is abduction nerve. This is basilar with its perforators. Fenestration is done. This is thalamus, thalamistered vein. This is chiasm. Basilar artery with its perforators. Correct plexus enters into the third ventricle. This is oclomotor nerve, just below the posterior cerebral artery. Next case, eight years female presented with headache and walking difficulty, which it can show triventricular megaly we did etb with rigid endoscope entering into the lateral ventricle c deficient septum pellucidum cord plexus of the opposite ventricle is seen this is thalamus stud vein Cord plexus goes down to the temporal horn. This is frontal horn. This is caudic nucleus. This is caudic nucleus. Forms the lateral wall of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This is anterior column of the fornix. This 
This is thalamus. This is thalamus. You know, phonics is a white matter band connects hippocampus to mammillary body. We go inside the third ventricle. This is mammillary body, basilar top, translucent, tuberculinarium. This is dorsum cella. This is infundibular recess. This is optic chiasm. This is optic chiasm. Above the optic chiasm, this is laminar terminalis. You know. Laminar terminus is a thin sheet of gray matter. Behind, we can see this is interthalamic adhesion. I mentioned earlier, care must be taken during movement of the rigid endoscope. We try fenestration with electrodes. Try to make it dilate with balloon catheter. Fenestration is done. There is so much scar in prepondent system. There is a phony condition of the phonics. During manipulation of the resin endoscope, it causes phonicial injury. Phonicial injury may cause memory impairment in the form of retrograde amnesia. This is up, up a chasm. Contused fornix. This is up a chasm above lamina terminalis. This is infundibular recess and above optic chasm. This is lamina terminalis. This is up a chasm. Laminar terminus forms the anterior wall of the third ventricle. This is interthalamic adhesion or massa intermedia, which connects the two sides of thalamus. This is anterior column of the fornix. This is thalamus. This is thalamus stud vein. Again, optic chiasm. This is infundibular recess. This is laminar terminalis. It forms the anterior wall of the third ventricle. This is equiduct, thalamoestral vein, and this is caudate nucleus. This is earlier version of flexible endoscope. It has narrowed uh, diameter, but it has uh, limitations, less fiber optic, poor image quality. <clears throat> we did ETB with earlier version of flexible endoscope. Vision is slightly poor than rigid endoscope. We enters into the third ventricle. ETB is already done. True is Stoma of the ETB, we proceed in prepontent system. Advantages of the flexible endoscope is it has more flexibility, 
we can move anteriorly, posteriorly, and see surrounding structures more than rigid endoscope. Through opening, we try to see inside the prepontent system. This is basilar artery and its perforators. You see, this is below, this is vertebral artery. This is vertebral artery on both sides, unite to form basilar artery. It is not possible with rigid endoscope. Go inside the prepontent system. As narrow diameter of flexible endoscope, more flexibility, we can approach through opening into the prepontent system. We try to break the band of arachnoid with monopolar electrodes. Again, you see, this is vertebral artery. On both sides, you need to form basilar artery. Flexible endoscope, earlier version also beautiful endoscope, but it has some limitations. It has poor image quality. Next case, three years, six month old female child presented with headache and vomiting. MR of brain shoal. There is a posterior fossa tumor, obstructs the acuitus and causes obstructive hydrocephalus. This is posterior fossa tumor. And we did ETB with uh, flexible neuroendoscope chip on tip. We have got recently, it has advantage, improved visualization, high definition camera, integrated LED light source. So no light cable needed, a smaller outer diameter is only 2.9 millimeters. So we can use in narrow foramen of Monroe in adults and also periodic patients. This is the working channel of chip on tip neuroendoscope. It is endoscopic catheter. No additional camera head is needed. We ETB with this chip on tip flexible endoscope. Enhances visualization. Chip on tip flexible endoscope has overcome earlier version of flexible endoscope, it enhances visualization, high definition camera, so we can see clearly. This is lateral ventricle, this is cord plexus, thalamus strut vein, fornix. After entering the third ventricle, this is basilar artery with posterior cerebral artery, two mammillary bodies, dorsum cella, infambular recess, and this is oclomotor nerve. And this is oclomotor nerve below the posterior cerebral artery. And this is optic chiasm. Behind, this is thalamus. This is cerebral aqueduct.
and this is posterior commercial. You know, it is white matter band, connects to cerebral hemisphere, and this is spinal recess. And behind this is hebinular commercial. This is also white matter band, connects to hebinular nuclei, and this is suprapineal recess. This is suprapineal recess. And internal cerebral vein confluences to form vein of gallon. And it, it is posterior part of the third ventricle. It contains cord plexus also. And through a cerebral equiduct, we can see fourth ventricle. And, and this is tumor. This is tumor. This is tumor. Aqueduct is hugely dilated, so we can easily go through aqueduct and see the fourth ventricular content. This is thalamus. This is thalamus. This is thalamus. This is PCOM. This is PCOM artery. Again, we can see this is frontal horn. This is caudate nucleus. This is caudate nucleus, component of basal ganglia. This is septal vein, thalamus straight vein. Due to flexibility of flexible neuroendoscope, we can see around easily. You can see narrow prepontent system, basilar artery compresses the dorsum sala. So in these cases, though transparent tuber cinereum, so care must be taken to fenestrate the floor of the third ventricle. This is infundibular recess. I try to make fenestrate on either side of the basilar artery. This is monopolar electrode called bug P. Opening is already created. Again, we try to see posteriorly. This is aqueduct. This is thalamus. This is posterior commercial. This is spinal recess. This is heavy nodal commercial. And this is suprapineal recess. And this is apicaism. This is apicaism. Anticon of the fornix go behind to form body of the fornix. This is looks strange, whiter appearance. This is this is thalamus. This is thalamus. Fornix, this is caudic nucleus. Cord plexus, septum pellucidum. Infundibular recess and anteriorly optic chiasm. This is thalamus strut vein. 
posterior commissure, anteriorly cerebral aqueduct. This is internal cerebral vein confluences to form the vein of Galen. This is suprapineal recess. This is oclomotor nerve just below the posterior cerebral artery. This is thalamus to mammillary body. Again, oclomotor nerve. Optic chiasm, cerebral aqueduct behind posterior commission. This is thalamus. Through cerebral aqueduct, you can see the tumor. This is dilated cerebral aqueduct. Infinibular recess, dorsum cella, basal artery, two mammillary body, thalamus. And this is PECOM. This is PECOM. This is posterior cerebral artery. This is oclomotor nerve. Complications are hypothalamic injury, injury to the pituitary stroke, transient third or sixth nerve pulses, injury to the basal artery, injury to the PECOM or PCA, hemorrhage can occur. Damage to fornix during manipulation of endoscope causes memory impairment in the form of retrograde amnesia. Infection may occur, fever may occur. In management of hydrocephalus, uh, following BP shunt, the size of the ventricle uh, decreases quickly, then ETV. So follow up MRI of brain six weeks to two months later, reveal resolution of ventriculomegaly. Sagittal T2 weighted thin slice will show dropout of T2 signal at stoma of PT. Children may be followed intermittently in the post operative period with MRI of brain. Success rate in literature is range 6 to 94%, average is 56%. Suspect rate in infants may be poor because they may not have normally developed subarachnoid space. Low success rate if existing pathology includes tumor, previous shunt, previous subarachnoid hemorrhage, whole brain radiation, significant scarring or addition in basal system. ETB success is score predicting the success of the ETB. It uh, based on three factors, age of the patient, etiology of the hydrocephalus, and history of the ventriculoperitoneal shunt. It comprises total 90% score, it score less than 40% correlated with very low chance of success. It scores more than 80% correlated with a better chance of success. In conclusions, endoscopic instruments and optics have improved significantly. The complications of infections and shunt malfunction associated with PSF shunt systems remain persistent source of morbidity and mortality in children. And in an effort to reduce the shunt burden in children, neuroendoscopy has seen a resurgence in its use in the past two decades. This is end of my talk. I am stopping here. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Dr. DM Arman, for your elaborative and iconic talk on endoscopic uh, ventricular anatomy as well as endoscopic uh, procedure. I think this endoscopic procedure can observe by any beginner or any experienced neurosurgeon repeatedly for their experience, improvement of experience. Thank you again. Now I invite Dr. Nefaur Rahman. He is assistant professor working in pediatric neurosurgery, Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital, Bangladesh. Dr. Nafaur will present a very important topics that ventriculoperitoneal shunt, how we do, do it. Some people think ventriculoperitoneal shunt is the easiest operation. Actually, this is the toughest operation as because there is a lot of complication in ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So for patient benefit, if we follow, well, that will help patient too much. 
Dr. Nafaur will enlighten us about ventriculoperitoneal shunt insertion techniques and procedure. Dr. Nafaur, please. Assalamu alaikum. Please mute. Is it full screen? Yeah. I am doing full screen in my laptop. Everything is okay. You can start. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Nafur. I am working as an assistant professor in Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, National Institute of Neurosciences and Hospital. Thank you, John Bennett, for Neurosurgical TV. And thank you, Department of Neurosurgery, for arranging such a beautiful program. Uh, today's my topic is deep shunt, how we do it. Before uh, going to uh, operative procedure, I go through the introduction of the VP shunt, epidemiology of the VP shunt, and indication of the VP shunt and patient selection. So in introduction, since the inv invention of the first implantable shunt by Nielsen and Speed 60 years ago, there have been innumerable innovation and new design of shunt equipment to treat radiatic hydrocephalus. Shunt have made a dramatic impact on previously devastating disease. That it is hoped that continued basic and clinical research will lead to advances in the management of radiatic hydrocephalus and improve the quality of life of ictate children and their families. So what are the epidemiology? The uh, management of the hydrocephalus with uh, cerebrospinal fluid shunt is the CSF shunt is the most common neurosurgical problem encountered in the pediatric age group. Clinical research network estimated that 38,200 to 39,900 admission and uh, 391,000 to 433,000 hospital days and total hospital charge was 1.4 to 2 billion for pediatric hydrocephalus. So it is clearly stated that the treatment of hydrocephalus with shunt carries significant cost to patient, families, healthcare center, and funding organization also. First time shunt insertion is predominantly performed by pediatric neurosurgeon. In the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgeons uh, database, 73% of patients who present for first time shunt insertion was six months of age or less at the time of in insertion. So, Furthermore, the median corrected is of patient interest in the shunt design trial is 55 days. So what are the indications for shunting? Indication for VP shunt is ventriculomegaly, baby who present with irritability, vomiting, a full fontanel, splayed suture, and increasing head circumference. In case of uh, uh, this are a indication for younger child, in case of older child who present with headache, vomiting, and papilledema, so such patient has a fissure of raised ICB shown in ventricular shunting. How we select patient before ventricular shunting? When a patient would come to enlarge ventricle with us, then we at first see, is it compensated hydrocephalus or un un uncompensated hydrocephalus? If it is uncompensated, that is not compensated by the patient, then go to the shunt. If it is compens compensated both clinically and radiologically, then if mild ventriculomegaly, then observe. If moderate or severe ventriculomegaly, if patient is less than three years old, shunting advocated by someone and further study is required to establish this. If moderate ventriculomegaly and patient is five years old, then it should to observe. So this is the patient selection procedure. What are the case tips? of VP shunt. Before VP shunting, we do some uh, investigation for general anesthesia, that is pre-operative workup and imaging studies uh, for uh, ventricular shunt. And this is the procedure. This is the position of the patient. This is the position of the patient. Position is the patient is super position, uh, head turns towards the opposite side. This is the proposed incision line. Incision line showing there is an incision line at the uh, cranial end, cranial end at uh, right uh, kiss point. And this is the incision line uh, 
at the abdominal end. This is the preping of the patient. The preping is done by the uh, iodinated uh, medium. This is a bio biodine hex scrub and hex cell to make the skin uh, free from germs and make it uh, to prevent the uh, shunt infection and skin site infection. This is the draping of the patient is done by sterile uh, draw sheet. Uh, and uh, this is the dissection of the abdominal limb. Uh, this is the uh, abdominal limb dissection. Is, here is showing the dissection of the abdominal limb. Uh, to open the parietal peritoneum. Here is a parietal peritoneum is found and we opening and make a hole in the parietal peritoneum to placement of the shunt in the peritoneal cavity. In this uh, picture uh, showing, uh, there is a uh, partial sting is uh, taken uh, to uh, uh, prevent the displacement of the shunt uh, when we inserted uh, it with the parietal peritoneum. Then this is the dissection of the cranial limb showing this is the uh, cranial intersection. This is the skull bone is showing. This is the galia is showing. Then bar hole is made with the Hudson dress. Then after bar hole making, we uh, made a subcutaneous tunnel. We are showing the uh, we are uh, doing subcutaneous tunneling to placement of the vibration within the subcutaneous tunnel. Then uh, widening of the uh, subcutaneous tunnel at the cranial end was done uh, due to uh, placement of the valve of the baby shunt. The widening of the uh, showing, we are uh, trying to widen the uh, cranial end uh, subcutaneous tunnel. And there is placement of the shunt. This is the shunt. We are placed with the subcutaneous tunnel. This is the valve of the shunt. After placing of the shunt, then we uh, use the antibiotic usually gentamicin is used to irrigate the uh, shunt channel and uh, to see the patency of the uh, shunt tail. There is we show there is uh, we are giving a gentamicin solution within the shunt tube. Uh, this ensures that the patency of the shunt tube and also irrigate the shunt tube with antibiotic uh, solution. This is the durotomy at the cranial end. We had. Uh, uh, durotomy is done by the point in 9, Then after durotomy, we use the uh, uh, brain cannula to cannulate the ventricle. At, uh, after cannulated the uh, ventricle, we use uh, the cranial end of the shunt uh, to place within the cannulated ventricle. Uh, show you, there is a showing. We use the uh, we use the cannulated uh, uh, we use the cranial end of the vibration uh, to cannulate it within the ventricle. Mm -hmm. Then uh, CF, CSF comes out. Uh, CSF is uh, taken for study. Yes, wow. showing the CSF is taken for study. Right. Mm. Then oh, connection with the, here is showing there is a connection with the valve. Connection with the valve. Uh, that is the uh, 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 cranial is connected with the valve. And after uh, connection with the valve, we confirm the free flow of CSF. There is a showing the droplet of the CSF. Free flow of CSF is confirmed there. Then abdominal uh, end of the then shunt was placed within the uh, abdominal cavity. Here is showing the shunt is, uh, shunt is placed within the abdominal cavity. Then after placement of the shunt with the cranial cavity and abdominal ca cavity, we close the uh, abdominal cavity, cranial cavity to prevent displacement of the shunt. Here is showing cranial limb that, that is uh, in cranial we fix the shunt that uh, it should prevent migration of the shunt downwards. And within the abdominal limb, we also uh, close the partial string suture uh, to uh, prevent displacement of the shunt. And after uh, closure, uh, the final closure of the skin, there is a showing the cranial limb the closure and uh, showing of the abdominal limb, the uh, closure of the abdominal limb. This is the whole procedure of the shunt. I will show some more success of the shunting procedure. You are showing two images. This image is, uh, is taken before operation of the uh, patient. Uh, there is a you uh, moderate to severe hydrocephalus uh, show, showing triventricular megaly. And after shunting, there is there is a showing the shunt within the ventricle shunting. There is the uh, reduction of the ventricular size and improvement of the children was possible. And here is also showing there is the enlargement of the ventricle with the Dandewakan malformation. This is the case of Dandewakan malformation. Uh, uh, Yshant was given. Uh, there is a uh, enlarged 
uh, frontal horn and Mickey Mouse appearance was noted. After giving shunt, we do CT scan and showing that there is the reduced size of the uh, frontal horn of the ventricle and uh, third ventricle also re uh, reduced in size. There is showing the shunt, uh, both two shunts, uh, one in the uh, posterior portion and another in the uh, lateral ventricle. So this is the all about the shunts, uh, how we do it in our institute. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Nafaur, for your very important and elaborative uh, talks on ventriculoperitoneal shunt, its indication, and how we implanted it. Please mute all other people mic. And now this is the last talks of today's topics. And I, Dr. Shudipta Kumar Mukherjee, uh, started with a talks on uh, evolution of VP shunt and uh, uh, management of hydrocephalus. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes, put it on presentation mode, okay? Okay. Okay, now perfect, okay. perfect, perfect. So I, I will start. Evolution of VP shunt, actually, this is a long talk. The hydrocephalus and its management, it is really uh, related with development and comes parallel to human civilization. Uh, to, 2500 BC, Pharaoh Ikhtan, uh, Ikhanton, he had a uh, mummy which was found in Egypt and uh, he shown that he may have hydrocephalus. Later, the ventricular, uh, the hydrocephalus was nicely described by Hippocrates later on Galen. Galen, who Describe the ventricular uh, um, ventricular system, but ventricular outflow he described in a different way. That means he uh, described CSF goes to pituitary gland and goes out through nasal cavity. Because at the time of Galen, there was no way to dissect a human cadaver. He depends upon actually animal dissection. Later, Abul Kashim Al Jawahari. He also known as Al Abul Kashish, uh, living in Cordoba. Actually, he described infantile hydrocephalus in detail. In 16th century, Andreas Vesalius provides first mention about the anatomical basis of hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. Later, Leonardo da Vinci, he uh, made a drawing of ventricular system where almost uh, uh, corrected a ventricular system he uh, drawn. After uh, some year in 19, 2023, a book named Dropsy was published by Robert Wheat, where he described that how hydrocephalus form and why hydrocephalus form. In 1949, Nulsen and Spitz implanted a shunt successfully. Between 1955 and 60, four independent group invented distal slit bulb and proximal slit bulb. In 1960, a combined invention of artificial bulb and silicon material. At the moment, 127 different design of shunt is available all over the world. In 1990, there is a renaissance of endoscopic procedures. In 1895, Nicolis developed some implantation uh, substance that was made by gold for CSF drainage. Andreas Vesalius found no water or anything outside of ventricle, the CSF mainly staying in ventricle. Later, Chiari, Giovanni, Morgagni, they also described the CSF pathway and CSF formation. Francois Mezendi, 
he described about the about Suramena Nizendi. Walter Dandy and his team, they did some animal study and they told that equiductal uh, blockage is the main cause of hydrocephalus. Later, Foramina Monroe, Foramina Monroe described by Alexander Munro II and uh, he, uh, Raymondi also described the causes of hydrocephalus. Now, how hydrocephalus management developed? Somebody tried to reducing the CSF production by deactivating choroid plexus by its removal by pharmacotherapy or by radiation. Somebody reopening intracerebral block fluid pathway with a bypass or some other means. Somebody trying to improve absorptive, reabsorptive capacity of CSF. So people work through this three way uh, from ancient time till date. So how people work for uh, reducing the CSF production. Some people doing bandaging, water reducing diet, drug and radiation. Later acetazolamide used by Tigrisi 1954 and it is very effective until date it is used. Nearly all the BP shunt mentioned by publication in 18th and 19th century ended fatally, except one published by Fantoni in 1769. Why ended fat fatally? Because at that time there is no good uh, sterilization procedure. So all the CSF diversion procedure was infected very uh, fatally. So ultimately patient, uh, a lot of patient was not survived. The history of BP shunt under modern aseptic condition, that is very important, aseptic condition begins with one nick and who punctured the trigon with a trocar later approach 1881. Uh, Dandy 19, 18, diagnostic BP chant by gold standard for diagnosis of ventricular dilatation. And until the era of CT scan, his description everybody supported. Pneumoencephalography has fully replaced by CT scan or MRI nowadays, but initial days, pneumoencephalography uh, support a lot. The drainage device, uh, hollow metal needle used rubber tube by Shen 1903, and some people use silk, horsehair, glass, gata parcha, cat gat, a lot of things they try to uh, use for trying to remove the um, CSF. Fedor and Cross in 1911 succeed in draining of hydrocephalic ventricle continually for a period of eight weeks without causing CSF infection. Queen Kiss earliest application of lumbar puncture was treatment of hydrocephalus. They feel temporary improvement, but later 1902, Oppenheim referred 11 publication treating hydrocephalus by lumbar puncture. So some uh, illustration of from old uh, procedure, one by Pierre, he tried to use ventriculo superior sagittal sinus shunt. <clears throat> and this is the picture of Walter Dandy where he can uh, detect uh, the aqueductal stenosis is the main cause of hydrocephalus. Ventriculo cisternostomy or torquil dis descent shunt in 1938 observed a spontaneous cure of hydrocephalus by ventricular rupture and was thus lead to invent from bypass drainage from occipital horn into the cisterna magna using simple valveless catheter, so called ventriculo cisternostomy or torquil descent shunt. 
here some picture uh, where uh, some people show plexotomy by dandy in 90 uh, 1918 open third ventriculostomy by walter dandy interior ventriculostomy through lamina terminalis so drainage into external subarachnoid space with implant third ventriculostomy in 1908 uh, <coughs> Anton and Brahman describe the passes through corpus callosum into interhemispheric fissure by means of a special perforator. Mixter in Boston inspected the ventricle with endoscope in 1923. Perforate the floor of the third ventricle during procedure. Already Dr. D.M. Arman, he described the endoscopic third ventriculostomy history. In 1930, Putnam and Descartes as a better result, but still harsh result, a high mortality rate, 25% with endoscopic cauterization in addition to third ventriculostomy. See, the PR, he tried repeatedly for developing a shunt from ventricle to superior sagittal sinus initially by some saponous vein graft, then valveless vein graft, then by rubber tube, but almost all uh, procedure was not successful due to it causes thrombosis within the superior cervical sinus. This is ventriculostomy <coughs> by Nashik and in 1974, Yasser Gill published an experiment aimed to improving CSF absorption with the help of momentum, but the trial uh, was partly successful. In Gram 1948, implanted catheter made newly developed synthetic polythene into venous system of the hydrocephalic dog. So there is a lot of trial by different people to subgadial tissue, jugular vein, from every place of the body for reduction, uh, CSF diversion. Nulsen and Spitz in 1949, they developed a shunt bulb. Still now Spitz shunt bulb is available. So this is one of the modern uh, bulb developed by or sleep bulb developed by Nulsen and Spitz. They use distal teflon or transverse slit and by pudens and here. This picture causes revolutionary uh, work in the history of hydrocephalus management by an engineer, not by a neurosurgeon. Mr. Halter. He was an engineer. His baby, his son, suffering from Cassie, suffering from hydrocephalus. For Cassie's hydrocephalus management, he developed a silicon slit bulb. But unfortunately, before development of his bulb, Cassie was operated. But Cassie's result of operation was not smooth. So, but Halter worked with uh, other uh, surgeon later, that is Spitz, so developed a very good shunt. It's work something like the baby's feeding bottle feeder, uh, feeder. So you know the feeder tip is not open if baby not sucked in a fixed pressure. So there is a pressure uh, changes within bottle and out of sucking. He just technically developed a new shunt with halter bulb 
made by silicon with this technique. Later, Rudi Schulte, a wasp maker, newly immigrated from Germany, he joined with Pudens and here they developed silt distal fluid valve. That is called uh, Pudens here Schulte fluid valve. The initial days, how they develop a programmable shunt. That is, they use a magnet in outside and there is a screw within the shunt and the screw is moved by magnet. And so the shunt pressure is uh, maintained from outside. In 1960, approximately 200 different bulbs is designed in 19, since 1949. As 1999, at least 127 commercially available. On closer inspection, first generation shunt is ball and cone, diaphragm, proximal fleet, different pressure. In second generation, adjustable, auto regulating, anti siphon, and gravitational ball. Hakim, he developed the new programmable shunt with 18 option till date. The middle Hakim valve has 18 position, so it can manage a wide range of pressure. Auto-regulating valve develop later, and it depends on differential pressure by flow regulation. Auto-regulating valve is the Bulb is the change of resistance in response to differential pressure. Thus, limit the flow constitute another advanced group of differential pressure bulb. The first practically available autoregulating device realized by Santi Rose in 1984, that is called Orbis Sigma Bulb 2. And after 1996, Orbis Sigma Bulb 2, despite difference in technology, <coughs> Peace and Phonics Diamond, Podman Siphon Guard also belong to this group. These are two anti siphon bulbs. The lower one we use here uh, very widely in our country. That is called PS Medical in, um, Bulb. It has an inlet, it has a dome reservoir. Its lower surface is contour made, that means fit with a skull very nicely. It has a distal bulb also. And there is a anti siphon device in the last end. So the Metronix PS Medical anti siphon, that is called delta bulb, is good uh, and simple also. And there is another example is, uh, is hair Schultz anti siphon bulb and radionics flow regulating bulb. Gravitational bulb was uh, patented by Hakim in 1975. Later, <coughs> surprisingly, minimal interest of the design for last 20 years, but recently some people show interest again for gravitational bulb. An ideal shunt is one that the normal brain resorption of CSF into venous system via arachnoid granulation, control intracranial pressure, handle various CSF pressure chains, reconstitute CSF mentally. So an ideal shunt should have this four property. That means CSF resorption like normal, intracranial pressure maintenance in different situation, and reconstitute cerebral mantle. Anatomy of modern shunt system. There is a inflow device that is ventricular catheter, a bulb mechanism, and the outflow device. A ventricular catheter is, uh, there are some hole in the tip, usually one centimeter, and the length of the catheter varies from 15 to 23 centimeter. Diameter, inner diameter, 1 to 1.6 millimeter. The hole is in a 4 to 
three to four row in the tip and four to eight hole in each row. The major aim is to co continue research shunt material to limit the cell and protein addition in the tube on the surface. That is very important, the protein addition and cell addition. Distal catheter is 90 to 120 centimeter long, 0.7 to 1.3 millimeter inner diameter, and it is made of silicon polymer. It is impregnated with radio opaque material, maybe barium or tantalum, and a slit bulb may or may not present in distal. Now, antibiotic impregnation. Few companies like Codman make bacterial catheter. Uh, Metronic may Aris catheter have antibiotic impregnated shunt. How they made antibiotic impregnated shunt? They uh, cover shunt with uh, rifampicin and clindamycin. So it gives at least 31 days support. So there is a less chance of infection in that vulnerable time. So, so a shunt may be differential pressure bulb programmable shunt, flow regulated bulb, gravitational bulb. A differential pressure bulb is working in different pressure and Chabra shunt, which is widely, very widely used in our country is one pressure control shunt. This is a picture of Chabra shunt. <coughs> Adjustable shunt or programmable shunt different company has different trade name like flow regulated bulb we already say uh, flow regulated shunt made by metronix that is called uh, ps medical bulb that is orbis sigma is uh, two is another flow regulated bulb here there is a <coughs> compilation of different shunt first generation bulb that is uh, fixed pressure, free pressure range, low, medium, and high. That is basic fixed pressure. Second generation shunt, that is fixed differential pressure with or without anti-siphon device, like Corby Sigma, Delta, programmable shunt, like Codman Hakim, Strata by Metronic. Third generation shunt, third generation shunt, Codman has uh, siphon guard shunt, strata two by Metronic, and programmable gravity activity by ProGab Escudab. So this is a uh, fourth generation shunt by programmable shunt assistant by Escudab that can uh, control from distant place. This is a programmable shunt, Strata MR2 by Metronic. See the programming device. It has four uh, parts. And by this device, we can program or reprogram the shunt. This feature is very important. That is the opening pressure, closing pressure, and performance level of a shunt. This is the Strata bulb. And this is another strata NSC. This is a Aris catheter. This is a flow regulated shunt. This is flow regulated. <coughs> this is a flow regulated shunt. Take home message the uh, flow regulated shunt is a good choice in case of high protein content. Flow regulating shunt OSB2 uh, over drainage on under drainage is minimum. Flow regulated shunt differential pressure bulb is used and decrease the over drainage. In flow regulated shunt, physiological response therefore less susceptible to siphoning. In flow regulated shunt, slit like ventricle may be result from over drainage. This is one of the problem in flow regulated shunt. Flow regulating technology decreases the risk of mechanical complication like over drainage, under drainage, and obstruction. So, shunt 
we have a lot of shunt material in market. Uh, you see there is a 197 shunt design in market, but the we have three take home messages. Evolutionary history of hydrocephalus and its management is parallel to history of human civilization. <clears throat> no specific treatment is ap applicable to all hydrocephalus patient as this disease etiology and pathogenesis is diverse. All resources is not equally distributed to all part of the world. So customization management system is very important. <clears throat> In next session, we try to focus on Vipishant complication, how we can overcome Vipishant complication, standard and ideal Vipishant, and uh, ETB, uh, uh, correct plexus coagulation is an adjunct in addition to ETB. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. And now floor is open for question. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Shrita Kumar Mukherjee, for your nice talk. I must say, it is difficult talk, but you narrated excellently. You know, Dr. Shrita Kumar Mukherjee is an assistant professor and head of our Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery. He owned the Pediatric Neurosurgery in Bangladesh. Thank you very much, Dr. Shrita Kumar Mukherjee. John, you are muted. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I should know, said Devka. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I'd like to thank all the speakers for taking the time and uh, and uh, extend the welcome to use this time to ask questions. Okay, the floor is open. If there is no question, I have comments. The all speaker like Dr. Taspia nicely described ventricular subgallial shunt. Though it is a new topics, I think it should be widely used for malnourished, cachectic, hydrocephalic baby. And this procedure, I think, will improve with further research. Dr. Nahid described the external ventricular drainage very nicely and external ventricular drainage management, everybody in the hospital should know about it. Dr. D.M. Arman nicely and elaborately described the anatomy of ventricular system as well as third, uh, few important video for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Dr. Nafaur Rahman, he described that how we can put a VP shunt and we invite question, otherwise, uh, John, you can uh, conclude the session. Okay, very good. Uh, I think uh, people will get less shy as time goes on as far as asking questions. It's such an important topic and, and well put together, well organized, Sudipka. Thank you very much for moderating. And, and this will have what's called good shelf life. It's going to be archived in a neurosurgical TV YouTube channel. And once Sudipka and his associates finish, you'll be able to look at the whole series of six, I guess, or more. Sudipka, I don't know how many you have planned, but uh, this is the third, uh, second one. So the third one is next week, right? Uh, two weeks, right, Sudipka? Okay. Dr. Alamgir, sir, are you available? No. Okay, so you can conclude. Okay, uh, yeah, I'd like to say, uh, Dr. Kabulo, I'd like to uh, greet Dr. Kabulo. He's in Japan now. Hello, yes. Dr. Kabulo. Uh, yes, on. Dr. Bennett. I think I had a, a, a small question to Dr. Tasfia. Okay. Can I carry on? Uh, Tasfia, please open uh, your mic. Can, yes, she is. Yes. Okay, t t thank you so much. Fantastic webinar. Uh, I congratulate all speakers. Uh, very, very nice talk uh, to all of them. But for Dr. Tafia, Tafia, 
those patients you are doing the ventricular subgallia shunt, why are you doing it to those patients with enlarged head? Because when the, the thickness of uh, the, scalp, the scalp is not enough, it means it won't work. And especially, I think one of the contraindications is you can't put it to malnourished uh, patient. I saw some of your pictures. Patients were already like um, uh, they had a uh, very enlarged head, but you went to put that uh, shunt. And after that, it was infected. Uh, there was like uh, a, a, a swelling on the scalp. Why are you putting that? I think it's a good idea, it's a good technique, but it has to be done on a healthy uh, patient. Why are you putting to those who are unhealthy? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, in our setting, we are doing it for malnourished patients. Uh, we're just buying time for them to improve their nutritional status before uh, going to a definitive procedure. And I think, uh, I would hand over to Dr. Shudip Kumar Mukherjee, sir, for further detailing, if you would like to, sir. Dr. Kabulo, for, uh, thanks for uh, asking the viable and important question. The okay. ventricular subgallial uh, shunt we use for rescue procedure. Actually, uh, those patients who may have hemorrhagic, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus or post-infective hydrocephalus, very early age, and big head malnourished. But what happens if the skin is very thin in case of malnourished, there is a chance of uh, infection. So if we cautiously handle the skin and make the po uh, pocket perfectly in the subgallial pocket, so there is a less chance of skin necrosis. So malnourished, patient has a more prone to necrosis, more prone to infection, but if you do the pocket cautiously under the gallia, not over the gallia, so there is a less chance of necrosis. Thanks for your important question. You're welcome, Dr. Sadipa. For how long are you keeping it? So usually we know that ventricular subgallial shunt is working for six weeks. After six weeks, CSF not absorbed from subgallial pocket. By this time, if there is a tense subgallial pocket, we can tapping the CSF from subgallial pocket. But we have very good uh, experience in our center. Most of the patients, they have no need of tapping. And so far, I understand Dr. Tafia shows some infection or skin necrosis may be downloaded from internet. That is not from our patient. So far, That's I not. understand. And our in our center, the result of ventricular subgallial shunt, not 100% uh, patient improved, but a good number of patients is improved. Later on, we did uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt or ETP after improvement of nutritional status. Thank you so much. So if you are interested, we can do more work, more research for ventricular subgallial shunt uh, because this is a, actually, this is a very old topic. You see when I show the old literature, I saw uh, initial days, uh, scientists try to start ventricular subgallial shunt or something like that. In that time, they have no good aseptic procedure for that reason, there was uh, successive failure. But in these days, we realize in some group of patients where no other validated alternative, subgallial shunt is a good procedure. The uh, good alternative is Umayya reservoir placement. You know, the result of Umayya reservoir placement in our place is not so good as we uh, get in literature. Why? Because if patient is admitted in our center for a long time and we can aspirate by our hand regularly by clockwise fashion through Umayya reservoir, maybe the result is good. <clears throat> but what happened? Patients' home is far away from our center, some patients. So they get discharged. So 
nobody take care of Umaya properly. What we found, Umaya is completely infected. Umaya overlying skin is necrosed. Umaya is get out of brain and patient was severely infected. That's why result of Umaya is not like the literature result. But in that case, ventricular subgarial shunt is a good alternative of Umaya. But Umaya is more scientific, I, I agree. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Gabulo. Do you do a lot of shunts, Dr. Gabulo, in the Congo? Of course, we do a lot of shunt. We we sometimes do. Um, there is an NGO which is supporting those uh, kids with um, hydrocephalus. So we do camps. Uh, we move from town to town, and so far we have operated already thousand kids with hydrocephalus. Uh -huh. So we move town to town. After three months, we go in this town and and so on. Abulo, from which country you are? I, I am from Congo, uh, Democratic Republic oh, of Congo, Congo, Central Africa. DRC. But, you, you yes, from DRC. DRC. I'm okay, from DRC. I, I, I went to Uganda for a uh, in 2015 in your yes. hospital for um, ETB CPC training. Yes, so yes. DRC uh, is not far from uh, Uganda. Yes, it is not far far from uh, from Uganda. Yes, currently I'm in Japan. I'm doing my fellowship in cerebral vascular okay, with. With Shahed from Bangladesh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I have interesting ask to DM Kabulo. I see, yes. I see similar first name, both of us. DM. Yes, oh, DM. DM, <laughs> DM Kabulo. From, from yes. In, 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 my, I'm, in my name, DM stands for Dawan Muhammad. What oh, is, okay. Uh, my, your, my, DM my, stands for what? My DM terms for Dieu merci, it's a French, uh, which means thank you, God. Thank you. Merci thank you. means thank you, Dieu is God. So Dieu merci means thank you, God. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. By the way, we're starting a channel uh, from the Congo also uh, shortly with Dr. Gabulo heading that. And we advise you to tune in. Okay, very good. I think it was a very good session and well organized. And we hope to see uh, you all in two weeks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for setting it up. Excellent job. Okay, I'm stopping this, and now I gotta yeah. stop.